Okay, well, welcome everyone. This is the first of our programs. I think we'll call them the Merchant's Way. And um, basically, I was inspired by this and prompted by this because England's abound. And by the way, we are in the UK. And uh, just to give you a location, for those of you who know England but you don't know it that terribly well, it might be helpful. If you think of London, we're about 120 miles north, northeast of London. The Cambridge, Cambridge the university town, for those wishing to be located. So we're just outside of the little market town, a historic town of Grantham in Lincolnshire. Now, I decided on these programs because England's abound with lots of beautiful historic houses. But most of the time, what you hear people talking about are kings and queens and nobles. There's never any mention of the merchants. And we're actually in a merchant's house. And this is a very unique house in England. And that's because there's so few of them left. This, as a matter of fact, is quite possibly the only one that gives us complete provenance. This is over 500, this was built over 500 years ago. And still today, a key goes into the door, opens the door, life carries on. So this is very unique, very special. And you may be wondering about these wall paintings behind me. They go all around the upper floor. These are actually said to be the most important, extensive, late domestic wall paintings in the country. Now, we're actually trying to have them conserved for future generations. So we need all the assistance we can get. So if you truly care about this, and even for people who think they might not, I'm hoping that you'll stay with us on these programs and you'll become captivated by what's being disgorged and you'll become in interested. Because I cannot emphasize how important this is. As we move into the electronic age, there are people might think, and when I say people, I particularly mean young people. You might think, well, you know, this is all old stuff. But I promise you, this, the history we're talking about with the merchants, is actually the blueprint for how we carry on life today. And even with the electronic media, I'd like to think that there are, there are going to be things which you will recognize. And I want you to remember this word, recognize. Because if you cannot recognize a thing, you will never be able to realize it. And as we go forward, within the wall paintings, within the architecture, we'll be drawing your attention to how to recognize, because if you can recognize, you'll be able to read these buildings. So, you know, one of the things we're falling foul of is that the young people are taken to these enormous edifices, edifices rolling in parklands, and they look beautiful. But what we must never f do is forget about these small vernacular buildings because it's actually these small vernacular buildings that holds our history. From a building like this, Ellis Manor House, we can actually read the whole of early modern European and British history, all tied up within the architectural language of this building. And I know that that might not mean an awful lot to a lot of you watching this, but in time it will. And you'll be able to see that the ability 
to be able to read these buildings, you will be able to read them for yourselves. So no matter where you're taken to, it could be the largest in the land, it could be the smallest in the land, it won't matter one jot. And that's because you'll be able to read the symbols, the architecture for yourself. And from that comes recognition. As you see, we've gained a little friend flying about. That's a very natural thing. What happens is people visit this house and we um, wall paintings, incidentally, there are three enemies. Strong sunlight, people rubbing up against them, and our breath. And so we keep windows open in order not to build up too much condensation and that sort of thing from our breath. And when we do so, our little moths fly in and they hide away in the beam ceilings. And um, at the end of the season, I have to collect them safely because we don't want to dispense with them and we put them out. So if whilst we're doing this, you see one flying about, at least you know it's a friend. And we don't want to start waving things about trying to shoo it out the shot. Doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter. Now, merchants, as I was saying, they're not talked about a lot. But you know, they need, they deserve far more credit. Because when you think about the old feudal system of knights, clergymen, peasants, we then start to see the, merchant, the emergence of merchants. And they're the one really that brought a lot of structure, economy, mercantilism into our system. And um, Basically, what we're looking at is organization, because we had the nobilities, the aristocrats. They didn't care to jot, so their thing was to spend, spend, spend. The knights, they defended. The clergy looked after our souls, the souls of the people. And of course, the peasant was responsible for the feeding of the people. But you see, with the merchants, there's a word which was used, usury. They were considered parasites because they thought they were all for themselves, money, money, money. But you know, away from that, they brought structure. They're really responsible for some of our finest cities Today we visit, some of us who are fortunate enough, we visit these cities. Venice, Flanders, and I could go on, but just to name or give you an example, a couple of examples. And you see the structure of how these were, and that was all brought about by the merchants. You know, the banking system. So we have a lot to be thankful for giving credit to these group of people. And there came a time when they suddenly realized that, you know, they could not be done away with because they brought so much into the structure of our society. You know, they were bringing some of the finest natural materials from all over the continent, all over the world. And today, as a matter of fact, we're abusing that. We've now got, we're, we're becoming, we're starting to, well, not starting, we've for some time, we've been indulging in too much synthetic materials. And that's causing an enormous problem. So we need to go back to natural materials in whatever shape or form. Because with natural materials, we know it will break down. It's recyclable, 
But some of the synthetic materials we're seeing in abundance, it will never break down for hundreds of years. And you know, that's what we're leaving for the next generation and the next, and so it goes on. And they're not going to thank us for it. So what we've done, we've actually created our own little online shop, Thus Merchant Ellis. And we're desperately trying to bring this to people's attention. You know, even, our, even the cotton t-shirt you see I'm wearing, we try to use organic cotton, the best possible cotton, no child labor, natural inks, and it can be done. Yes, we look at it and we think, but this is costly. But you know, when you look over a very long period, it's a false economy, the, the, the synthetic materials. Because the natural fibers will always last that much longer. It's less detrimental to our society. And it just means that, yes, the initial outlay may seem costly, but over a long period, it's actually far more economical. In, so there are many advantages to it. Now, we've got to re-educate ourselves into appreciating this. Yes, we know there are times, <coughs> excuse me, because maintenance sometimes take a bit more time, but we've just got to gear our lives to that, to make sure that you know, yes, we'll save some time here, and it may take us longer here, but at the end of the process, it's actually better for the planet, for the society. And, it, you know, that's, that can only be a win-win situation. So, you know, what we're trying to do, we, we don't want to lecture you into a do this, do that. All we really want to do is to bring this to your attention, which will always come back to the word I ta talked about, recognition. Because with recognition comes realization. But if we cannot recognize a thing, we have no ownership. With ownership, you feel you have a vested interest. Once you have a vested interest, then you start to care about that particular item or things. It's like, you know, if you have a child, suddenly your whole life changes. And that's what it's about, ownership. You recognize, you own it, you care for it. And that's where we want to be going with all of this. And we'd like to think that we're going to draw you into this world and we hope that you'll support us. And if you support us, that enables us to get things on an even keel. And we'd like to think that you'll be able to rely on us and we won't let you down. Because we are a private operation. <coughs> Excuse me, we get no government grants, no lottery funds, no nothing. All of this is from our tiny fob pockets. But we are totally committed. And because of that, we'd like to think that we can get that message over to you. You'll then rely on us. You will then assist us. And there'll be a working together of trying to achieve these things. Because we cannot go on endlessly thinking, let's kick this down the road for the next. I don't care. I won't be around for much longer. It's not like that. Each of us owe it to the next generation to make their lives that much more pleasurable. You know, we cannot go on saying, oh, well, I don't care. 
I throw it over the fence. The chap on the other side of the fence will have to deal with it. Doesn't work like that. You throw enough over the fence, it piles up, and before you know it's over on, in your, on your side of the fence. So it's a long-term task, but we need to have a consciousness about how we're going to solve this. And, um, you know, that will only come about by us working together. Now, I briefly mentioned some of these other wonderful cities. And, uh, <coughs> you know, one of the trades in all of these other cities, they all have their special trade. Glass, but for us in England, leather, but for us in England, it was the wool trade. That's what really saved England, the wool trade. There was a time when 50% of the wool leaving England was said to be worth 50% of the land. Can you imagine that? Today it doesn't seem as if we can get rid of wool. But then, wool was king. It's a natural fiber. And um, it's slowly, there are certain groups trying to get a resurgence of this. It may never come back to where it was, but people will in time see the benefits of it. You know, if you go back way back to Pompeii, Herculaneum, when we had those terrible disasters, the eruption of the volcano, and you can see, if you look at some of the figures, they're like suspended. And what, because all of the garments they were wearing, it was natural fibers. And so for that, it's a retardant. It's, it's, it's kept them in a shape, burnt onto them. It's left us something to study. Had they been wearing synthetic materials, there'd be nothing left for us to study because of the way it would have behaved. And so, you know, whatever we care to take, it doesn't matter how far back we go or how far forward we come, you can see there are advantages. And those advantages are worth knowing about because what we then do is to reconstruct our lives to suit those because we start to realize the benefits we get from it. And once you get benefit from something, it makes sense. Now, there are times that this has to be pointed out, to be realized, pointed out, because often we just go about life and uh, we take so much for granted. Now, you know, it's a funny thing. As we move forward into the computer age, people think, oh, well, this old stuff, we won't, what's it? But, you know, even words are vocabulary. We're seeing words which we used to use in days of old and had actually left our vocabulary. We weren't, it wasn't being used. And now, ironically, we're seeing in the computer age, these are coming back. And why is it coming back? Now, I'll give you an example, a word like scroll. The old manuscripts of scrolls, now we found ourselves not using it. And by not using it, the word has almost, had almost disappeared. But now, of course, it's been brought back by the revived by the computer because we scroll. The blue, the color blue, was one of the most difficult lapis lazuli to achieve. Incredibly expensive. And yet, and look, for those of you out there listening to this, do correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe the blue light on the computer was the last to be achieved. 
So it just goes to show how things repeat itself in different forms. But, you know, it would be foolish to think that, and I don't want to use that um, overused cliche of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Well, I said it, but I didn't use it, so you have to bear with me and forgive me. Now, the thing is, all of these, no matter the examples we're given, it all comes back to recognition and realization. So, we'll be going through an enormous amount, and we're going to share this with you. Now, obviously, we're within the building, and this is our painted chamber. But there are times when we're going to give you a different view of this building, because I think it's important for you to become immersed in the building, and you'll start to be able to understand it, and to be able to read it for yourself. So if you, and if and when you see another building that reflects the same things, you'll be able to identify it. Now, something of the painted chamber. What we have, and you, you'll not be able to see this um, because it's not in close-up, but I will try to point things out, and at some point we'll do inserts so you can appreciate what's going on. Well, as a matter of fact, on my mug, if you can see that, that's an interpretation of one of what we have on the wall behind me, which is one of Aesop's fables. It's accredited to Aesop. Now, when you mention that, most people will say, excuse me, will say, ah, oh, I did Aesop's fables at school. And it's almost said as if it's to be forgotten. That's something you do when you're very young. Well, I can tell you, the fables are for a lifetime. It's, you know, wise men would adorn their civic buildings, homes and gardens with the fables in the hope that those who had to make big decisions would be inspired to think wisely. And again, we'll share things with you, because I work with um, friends in Perugia, in Italy, and they have one of the most, well, it's said to be the most important medieval fountain in the world. And on the bottom basin, we share that same fable with them. Now, <coughs> excuse me. In some cases, we emanate from France, our theme, this theme that's going around the walls. So we've got Renard the fox. Now, for those French people, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation that it's not as French as it ought to be, Renard the fox. And we've got the crane. Now, what this depicts is when the fox is gorging itself on me, Renard, incidentally, was said to be the first trickster of Europe. And so we see the image of the fox and the crane's beak, as we saw on the mug, going into its mouth. Now, the reason for that, the fox is said to be gorging itself on meat. A bone gets lodged in its throat. He runs around in panic, begging the assistance of the bird, the crane, to assist. The crane has a surgical-like beak. So with that long beak, the crane manages to fish that bone out of its throat. The crane then asks to be recompensed, being the trickster he is. He looks at the crane. He says, You've just had your head down my throat, and you're still alive. That ought to be reward enough. 
you know, the fables will always have relevance no matter what age we're in. Even today, can you imagine if you went and saw your bank manager tomorrow and he said to you, Oh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Johnson, whatever your name might be, we look after your money so well. Do you want interest too? That's the sort of thing we're saying. Even that is recognized over a period. Now, the fables go back to early Greece. You know, as I said, it's the beginning of early modern European and British history. And so we're seeing how these things still today have relevance. So they should never be thrown out or thought, oh, that's what I did when I was young, because they're all relatable. Now, in this building we're in, when you do see the outside, what you'll notice are the crow step, what we call the crow step gables. It's the end of the building, the gable end of the building. They go up in steps. Now, obviously, in other countries, they're called different things. But here we call them crow steps. And it's lovely, actually, because there are times when you can actually see several crows sitting on the steps. I find it quite charming. Now, most people would say, ah, oh, they're Dutch, but they're not. There are the Dutch gables which are actually rounded, or you sometimes get the bell-shaped. And you do get them, the crow steps as well, in the Netherlands. But, you know, they can be seen all around the Baltic Sea. Now, I know, I do say, I did say, and I do say that this is a rare building in England today. But if anyone knows of Cheapside in London, Cheapside was said to be our first high street in England. And even, you know, when documentaries are made or period films, and it happens to be in the centre of London or even Cheapside, we never see any step gable buildings. They will just fill them with half-timbered houses. And, you know, it, it's not blame, but it's how we, one loses one's history because there are downstairs, and at some point we'll show this to you. We've got like a lithograph of Cheapside in about 1548. Edward VI Carnation Procession. And along Cheapside, what you see are the buildings with their, just like this, their crow step gables and their lookout towers. Those were fashionable at the time. But you know, come 1666, the Great Fire of London, all gone, obliterated. So today, Ellis Manor House stands testament to all of that. We have total provenance in this little building. And there are lots of symbols we'll be showing to you. Like, for instance, we have the merchant. You know, when the merchants, Calais was our main port. All the wool went down to Calais and from there distributed across. So it was the main port. Now, our merchant was a merchant of a staple of Calais. And we'll explain all of these things to you. Now, when their goods went down to Cali, there was, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> like a lead stamp. And they had the merchant's mark stamped on these. Now, as we went about researching all of this, I tried to 
I used to write to Kelly trying to find the merchant's mark. But you know, sadly, Kelly was so heavily bombed, today they have nothing. And you know, the irony is all roads, as they say, lead to Rome. Now next door, adjacent to this building, there's a church. And it's got an enormous lofty tower. It stands about 85, 90 feet. That is said to have been built, <coughs> excuse me, by the man who built this house. That was the way of the merchants, building their seat into the other life, making sure they'd get top seat. And on that tower, so he didn't actually, there are times when the merchant built the church. In this case, that didn't happen here. The church was there, but then he built a tower attached to the church. And on that tower, there are many symbols. And this, there are symbols there that takes us right across Europe, the continent. But we have and have found in the tower exactly what I was trying to get to see if I could get from Calais. And that is the merchant's mark. As you stand on the ground floor of the tower, it's divided in two halves, and you look up from ground floor, in each of the corners, there are four stone-carved merchants, all bearing their mark. But our particular merchant, he bears his mark on the wool sack. And you know, because wool was our savior, it was our big business. That's represented, you know, it was, um, um, his name escapes me, I'll come back to that. But you know, in England, our Lord Speaker in the House of Lords sits on the wool sack. And that is to show the importance of wool to England. Now, we also have, I should add, other lithographs downstairs, which we'll be sharing with you at some point. We see Henry VIII in 1523, opening Parliament, when they all had to be seated on the wool sack to show the pivotal role it had played for the country. And that carried on into Elizabeth I period, reign. But what we see there, it's post-Reformation. And you can see they're still sitting on the wall sack, but what's noticeable is there are no abbots. The church is not represented because it's after the Reformation. They've all been turfed out, I guess, to the abbeys. And now we see things like, you know, because the wool was our staple trade, it was terribly important that it's kept buoyant. So there were directive taxations brought about. For instance, when we died, we had to be shrouded in wool to be buried and apparently found not to be, the family paid a tax of five pounds, which may sound nominal now, but that was a huge sum. And also we had other situations, like apparently an Englishman had to wear a woolen cap to church, not the nobles, but the lessers. And if, I, if memory served me right, they were called the Monmouth Cap. And these were really taxation, forms of taxation brought about to keep it buoyant. So you can see the trouble that we went through to keep this staple trade. 
that today we all want very easy, drip dry, you wash something, you hang it up, it's dry, you rush, we rush about. But you know, we cannot continuously keep indulging like that. We have to come back to those natural fibers. The merchants had sailed the world for hundreds of years, bringing us the finest materials known to us. And, you know, if they were now to come back, I can tell you they wouldn't be very happy because we're abusing our time on the planet. And we're leaving so much rubbish, and literally rubbish, for the next generation. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but it needs to be addressed. You know, if you've got little ones, when you put them to sleep of the night, think what you're leaving for them to wake up to in the morning. You know, over a long period, that's exactly what you're doing. You're putting them to bed. Your little Jonathans, your little Mary, whatever nice names you've got, because they're precious to you. So why would you want them to wake up to that mess which we're creating? You know, it doesn't seem right, does it? It's a pulling the ladder up syndrome. You know, we all have a vested interest. And so for that, it's that ownership we talked about earlier on. We cannot go on like this. We have to. You know, each of us has to do something to enhance the other's life. We would all want our offsprings, our sons and daughters, to have an easier life than we did. You know, it's more appreciable. And they will go on and do the same for the next. That's what civilization is. You know, they, those are all the things we talk about, we brag about. And yet, you know, it, it's a notion, yes, uh, playing lip service to it. Then we drive along, we open the car window, and out the window it goes. We really do have to modify our behavior. And like I started off by saying, I don't want to preach to you about what you should do, or what I should do, or the next person should do. All I'm trying to do is to bring this to your attention, because there are times when we get caught up in our day-to-day -day life and we do go about things and we don't really necessarily think about what we're doing and if someone, it, they don't even need to say anything to us. Can you imagine if you had a passenger in the car and if when you threw that thing out the window they don't need to say anything to you they would just look at you out the side of their eye, the corner of their eye. And I can tell how you would feel. And that's all it needs sometimes, just to be reminded in the subtlest form. You know, it does take a village to bring up that child. And if we're all looking out for each other, that's how we keep civilization going, you know. And so through using the merchants as a platform, we'll be able to do this. Because yes, though they came into the society being sort of um, excluded, thinking they were all for themselves. What they actually did, they brought organization 
into the society. And we'll see that as this story unfolds. Because it's only with organization you get the banking, the structure. And they've left us an awful lot of their own history all written down. Because, you know, people are keeping books, accountants. It's all organization. If we become sloppy, we become savages. We don't care. Once we lose care for ourselves, you lose care for your fellow man. And that's the breakdown we see. So we want to use Ellis Manor House and Merchant Ellis as a platform to say, look, let's get back on an even keel. I'll use the metaphors of the nautical metaphor because of the shipping and that sort of thing. There may be times I might use a mixed metaphor. Then you'll have to forgive me. But we'll try to keep it nautical. And, you know, in time, as we start to walk you around, pointing things out around this room and around the house, we're hoping that you'll become so captivated by all of this it'll start to make sense. And you will, you know, I've got a dear friend and she's an archeologist. Now, can you imagine, she'd been doing this for a great number of years. And one day she said to me, you know, Clive, I'm absolutely amazed because until I got to know you, I didn't even notice the step gable buildings. And now everywhere I go, I find myself looking up at step gables or looking up at the gable end of a building to see whether they're stepped or not. And that's what we're trying to do, you see. Now, I didn't badger her into step gable buildings. It's just that she became aware. And once you've become aware of something, that's it. You notice it. And if you notice it, you may want to know more about it. And in time, some people, it's enough just to know, and others will get much deeper into it. And you want to find out more about it. But we want, for this voyage, for you to come on this voyage with us and tell your friends about it, tell your family, and see if we cannot create this enormous movement of people acting and doing things together. Doing something which can only enhance our lives and our future generation lives. You know, this if something's worth doing, then it may take more time. But in the end, I don't think you'll be displeased with what comes from it. You know, so I just hope that for those of you who've stumbled onto this, you've found us, tell your friends about us, tell your family, and keep an eye out because this will be the start of something new. Thank you for your time, and we hope you've enjoyed our first program, and we look forward to engaging with you further.